Okay, welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about balanitis. Um, this is one of the more common infections of the male reproductive tract. Um, this is very important for you to understand clinically. Now, in the United States, we don't see this as much as perhaps in Europe or in South America. And the reason is because uh, circumcision is very protective against developing balanitis and uh actually eliminates your risk of developing balanopostitis, which is uh, another thing we're going to talk about. They're commonly used interchangeably. Um, so in the United States, we don't see this quite as often just because we have such a high circumcision rate. And I am absolutely not going to wade into the circumcision debate. Um, different countries have different ideas of whether circumcision should be performed on infants. Um, you know, there are arguments in favor. Um, certainly, American medical associations uh, tend to look more favorably on circumcision and routine uh, infant circumcision. Um, whereas there are many groups, especially outside the United States, who um, really take issue with it. They believe that the risks outweigh the benefits. And many of these people, um, on some solid ground, do have some ethical uh, objections to this practice. And so my job here is not to wade into that debate. I am only going to bring this up objectively as far as the fact that I just want to point out here when we talk about phimosis and paraphimosis and balanitis and balanopstitis, um, your risk of having these is higher if you are uncircumcised. And that's just plain fact. Now, whether routine Infant circumcision is a good practice or not, I am not wading into that debate. So I just uh, figured I would uh, preface this talk by saying that. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very much who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications each and every time I put a new video up. All right, so balanitis and balanopostitis are Two names, and they're slightly different. However, the management is going to be the same. So balanitis actually comes from the Greek word balanos, which means acorn. And if you look at the head of the penis, it does kind of look like an acorn. Um, so that's where the name comes from. Uh, balanitis is an inflammation of the glands, of the head of the penis. And because inflammation of the glands often also affects the foreskin, the term balanopostitis is also commonly used. Now, many people use these interchangeably. They're not technically the same, but I am going to refer to this as balanitis, um, for, for both of these, just because it's easier to say. So balanitis affects 3 to 11% of males in their lifetime, so it is pretty frequent, and certainly your risk is higher, as mentioned, if you are uncircumcised. And the reason for that is because having that, I don't want to say extra skin, but having that skin, that foreskin, over the glands um, can result in the accumulation of smegma, um, which is purulent material. It can make it difficult to clean. And of course, all of that raises the risk of infection. Now, you really figure this out when you know that the most common etiology overall is candida albicans, a fungal infection. And so essentially, this is just the male equivalent of a yeast infection. Um, and actually, trichomonas is another possible cause, which we usually associate with vaginitis, but uh, it's another possible cause. So you can see how this is kind of analogous to some of those female problems. Uh, bacterial infection can also do it, especially group B strep and some of the uh, venereal diseases. You can also, this can also be non-infectious in origin, like contact dermatitis or local trauma. Um, now, balanitis is not an STI. Uh, however, it can be caused by some of the same infectious agents, including Neisseria and Chlamydia. And so we always need to work these patients up, especially if they're young men. We need to work them up uh, for the possibility of uh, one of these pathogens. 
Like I said, overall, the most common cause is fungal, and so it is more likely to occur in immunocompromised patients, especially those with diabetes. So consider diabetes in any older patient um, who has risk factors for type 2 diabetes because this can actually be the only presenting symptom of a new case of diabetes. Uh, as I said, in young men, think STI, and older men, uh, especially those with recurrent episodes, think of diabetes. It is more common in uncircumcised males due to, and again here, I don't want to uh, make overgeneralizations, but due to poor hygiene and the accumulation of smegma. It's just, it's harder to clean your penis when you have foreskin. It, it just is. Um, a, a circumcised penis can be much easier to clean because it's right there. I mean, the head of the penis is exposed to shower water, bath water, what have you. Um, if you are not circumcised, you actually have to consciously clean it, and not all people do that. So that is why the risk is higher. Features include just genital pruritus, red scaly patches or erosions. All of this is very consistent with you know, something that's itchy and painful. Um, so you, you see those things. Um, you can also appreciate smegma in some instances, and it can have an offensive odor. If there is, in fact, an offensive odor, you should think of bacterial, especially anaerobic causes, because candida, yeast infections, they don't really smell. So the diagnosis here is clinical. You do need to consider other dermatologic conditions like eczema, seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis, contact dermatitis, because these things can affect the penile skin as well. Um, so you do need to consider those things. Look for other parts of the body that are affected. Um, as we know, eczema, psoriasis can affect the entire body. There are a few different types of balanitis that are specifically not infectious in etiology. So BXO, balanitis, zeratica, obliterans, also called lichen sclerosis, looks the same as what you would see on the vulva in a woman, these white scaly patches. However, this often occurs in young boys around five, six, seven years old. And there is a risk factor, and that is hypospadias. Now, that doesn't really make much sense, does it? Remember, hypospadias is an abnormal insertion of the uh, urethra. So rather than the urethra being right here, we'll just say this is the penile head here, um, it would insert m more down here. So I don't uh, really know why that's a risk factor, but it is. Uh, zoone balanitis, also call, called plasma cell ba balanitis, this tends to occur in older men. I have a bunch of pictures. I'm going to save them for another video for reasons that I'm sure you understand. Um, and it'll be very obvious uh, when you see this. Circinate balanitis uh, tends to be these gray-white annular papules and kind of a geographic distribution. This is a manifestation of reactive arthritis. So remember Reiter syndrome, can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree? Um, this is the genital manifestation. So to work up, what we're looking for is infectious causes. So we do a potassium hydroxide prep for candida. You look at that under the microscope. And get PCR for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas. Um, you can also um, get it for uh, syphilis as well. Um, so work up for all those um, STD causes. Uh, another good thing to do here as part of your workup um, may include getting an A1C and a fasting blood glucose if you're dealing with an older man. Okay, so management, again here, address the underlying cause. Um, depending on whether you're dealing with an infection or not, you just treat this the same you would with any kind of infection. So if it's candidal, go with an azole and a fungal, gonococcal, go with ceftriaxone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for irritant or allergic causes, we often go with a topical corticosteroid. That can also be given if you have an infectious cause. Just make sure you're treating the underlying infection. Warm baths, cleaning, um, all of that is very, very important. Um, if it is candidal in origin, like I said, fasting blood glucose and A1C would be a good idea. And if it's an STI in origin, remember on CCS, need to inform sexual partners, the patient does, not you, and advise about safe sex practices. 
Complications, if there's repeated episodes, it can lead to scarring and ultimately phimosis. Um, so as a result, circumcision may be considered in these patients. Penile intraepithelial neoplasia and penile cancer is pretty much only going to happen in uncircumcised men. Um, this is very unlikely to come up on your exam, but if you do suspect it, you need to get a biopsy. Meatal stenosis can be a complication as well. You'll always refer these patients to urology. Do not worry about the treatment here, but it is de dilatation of the urethra. So to recap, balanitis is inflammation of the glands uh, because it often also affects the foreskin. The term balanopstitis is often used as well. It affects a good chunk of men in their lifetimes. Many will come down with this at some point. The most common cause overall is candida, often associated with diabetes, older men. The most common cause in young sexually active men is group B strep and STI pathogens. Make sure and remember your dermatologic causes because that could be behind it as well. The management is to treat the underlying cause. By the way, if you cannot identify it, you can go with a topical antifungal and a corticosteroid. Um, generally, I mean, if, you're, if you've already ruled out uh, STI causes, if you're not smelling anything consistent with uh, an anaerobic infection, go ahead and try an antifungal and a corticosteroid uh, and see if that works. If it does, you have your diagnosis. Complications, we talked about phimosis, penile cancer, and meatal stenosis.